So, Naysay, we were talking about Gulf War Syndrome. Tell us your story. You went into the Navy, you got your shots, and then... Well, it, it all starts off as a, um, as a Native American and English half-breed. Actually, British, if you want to be technical about it. Um, being raised in a family where my father was in the military, my brother was in the military, and uncles were in the military... And also being raised in a somewhat Native American ideology of where we are to be, for lack of a better term, warriors. But I do prefer the term defenders instead of warriors because I'm not a fan of war. School is done. When high school is done, if you weren't joining the military, then you were going to college. And at the time, I didn't know how I could get to college And so I joined the military. However, being a black sheep of the family, I had to join the Navy, where the rest of my family joined the Army. And I realized quite quickly that this was the wrong choice of military to join, since my last name, my last given name is Shores. So I joined the Navy. Um, At the age of 17... And because I wasn't 18, my father had to sign a waiver for me to join the delayed entry program. So after turning 18 in September of 1985, I shipped off to the Naval Training Center in San Diego, California. And if anybody knows about the history of the military, one of the first things that you do after you get your initial barracks and stuff, is you get inoculations. And how you do this is you stand in line and you follow these little footprints on the ground and where they were red, you would stop. And then on both sides of you would be military personnel or doctors or nurses with these air inoculation guns. And it would just be like... And then you would walk forward another five, ten paces, and then there would be more red footprints on the ground, and you'd stop there, and then it would be... And this is your experience in the military. They say, hey, report to sick bay and get a shot, and your only response is in the butt or in the arm, because you couldn't say, no, I don't want a shot. So ironically, in boot camp, Two weeks after I got the shot, I started tripping. And it got to a point of where the company commander made fun of me a couple times. And I told him later, you know, something's wrong. Can I go get this checked out? And he sent me to sick bay. So I go to sick bay and I find out that I'm suffering from something that is called perineal paralysis or perineal palsy, which is commonly called foot drop. Now, this means that the perineal muscle, which is the muscle that lifts your toe up, so you put your heel down first when you step, something was causing damage. However, I didn't think nothing of this. So after boot camp, I go into Radio Men A School, After Radioman A school, I go into Radioman C school, which is International Morse Code School. And upon completing that, I was supposed to go to Yakuska, Japan. However, because I could not get 32 words a minute in Morse code, which basically is like... And I just couldn't pass that. And so I got dropped from International Morse Code School, and my orders changed to stay right there in San Diego at the naval base called 32nd Street Naval Base, where I was on board the USS Fox CG-33. It was a guided missile cruiser, old frigate class that was chopped 
and a flight deck and a cannon was added to the ship. And so I got on this ship with Wild Bill Matthews was the captain. And the joke was the captain had such a horrible relationship with his wife that he volunteered for everything he could so he would not be in port. And because of this constant preparedness and ready X's, our ship was awarded the Battle E Award for the West Coast. And because of this award, we were selected to go on a world cruise where we were going to go around the world and show off our fabulous fox. Well, after going to Australia, we were underway to allegedly go to the Mediterranean Sea. However, while out in the ocean we get a message saying that the USS Stark was hit by an Iraqi missile in the Persian Gulf and we're going to be sent in to protect it. So next thing you know, we steam ahead to a little bitty unknown island to anybody except now called Diego Garcia where I cannot confirm nor deny what type of weapons we put on our ship. However, they did at one point request that if we wanted to talk to lawyers and get our wills prepared before we head to the Persian Gulf, this was an opportunity to do that, which showed the uh, the grave the the grave matter that we were about to embark on. Now, the thing that is so pivotal about this is that I was not there during the Persian Gulf War. I was in the Persian Gulf. Actually, we were the first ship to be put into the Persian Gulf under what was considered hostile situation that our ship the USS Fox we wrote the manuals on how the procedures were to go in and out the Straits of Hormuz at this time Saddam Hussein kept threatening us that he was going to shoot these missiles at us that were the equivalent of a Volkswagen bug being packed with dynamite which is a little bit nerve-wracking. So we get into the Persian Gulf, and we go up to the USS Stark, and I wish that we've been able to find the picture, but I have a picture of me standing in front of that huge, massive hole that was blown into the USS Stark that took, ironically, the number 32 lives. Or no, was it 33? 32, 33 but still both numbers are pretty uh, emphatic. So we're in the Persian Gulf, patrolling the Persian Gulf, and supposedly there to protect Kuwait. So then we find out that in this protection of the Kuwaiti people, we were ordered to escort oil tankers through the Straits of Hormuz which we were all questioning, if we're here to help the Kuwaiti people, why are we not escorting Kuwaiti people and instead escorting oil tankers? Now, the other irony is, as I stated earlier, that in the military, when they say get a shot, you go get a shot. And this was one of the things that occurred before we went into the Persian Gulf. We were all told to get shots again. Now, as we fast forward, we spend 74 days, I think it was, in the Persian Gulf, and then we had to go back to America. So we get back to America, to San Diego, shortly after my tour is done in the active duty. And (laughs) sorry, I said duty. But my. (laughs) (laughs) Don't be sorry. So, sorry. So after 
my tour was over, I had to report to Minnesota for reserve for the Naval Reserve. So while in the Naval Reserve until the 90s, all of a sudden I'm getting sick in the 90s. And I started getting sick rather quickly. And then by 91, I lost 60 pounds. And I went to the VA and I'm asking them, what's wrong with me? And they said, there's nothing wrong with you. Here's some Moltrin. Go ahead with your day. And all of a sudden, I kept getting sicker and sicker. Then a friend of mine asked me, do you know about the Persian Gulf Syndrome? And I'm like, yeah, of course. I'm paying attention. You know, and I'm listening to other veterans and stuff. And my buddy said, I think you have Gulf War Syndrome. And I'm like, that's impossible because we weren't there during the war. And he's like, well, there's a woman by the name of Joyce Riley who's with the American Gulf War Veterans Association who has given a lecture in Wisconsin. And if you want to go, I'll take you there. So we, this is uh, 94, 95 now. And so we go and listen to Joyce Riley's lecture and I am dumbfounded. She literally described the exact progression of what I was going through. Now, by this time, I'm already in a wheelchair. And so my buddy pushes me up to Joyce. She introduces herself. And um, she asked me if I was in the Persian Gulf. And I said, yes, but I wasn't there during the Persian Gulf War. And then she literally changed her facial expression and she leaned into me and she said, you know, I'm getting more and more reports that there are veterans that are sick that never even went in the theater of the Gulf War. And so at this point, me and Joyce became friends and she started giving me information. And this is when I parachuted down the rabbit hole. Because at this time, the only place you could find any information pertaining the Persian Gulf Syndrome slash illness was in the same places where they talked about secret societies and UFOs and Bigfoot and other conspiracy theories. And so by association, not only was I starting to research Persian Gulf illness, but I was researching these other conspiracies and conspiracy theories. So as I continued inten intensive research, thousands of hours of research, I came to the conclusion that it was absolutely, without a doubt, the inoculations that were given to us. At the beginning, some of the reasons that they were giving us to be sick were either because we were Americans, we weren't used to the fine dust or the fine sand that is in the Middle East, and that was causing us problems. Then we were told there were bugs or mites that were in the sand that were causing us problems. Then we were told that Saddam was using biological and chemical weapons. Then we heard that we were using biological and chemical weapons. And now we're getting into the year 98, 99, 2000. So in 1998, I organized at the school I went to, because at this time I could no longer work, that I signed up for the vocational rehabilitation because I was confined to a wheelchair with minimal dexterity and multitudes of health issues. And at this point, I already went blind in my left eye. So I organized 
to have Joyce Riley come up and give a presentation in 98 um, at the Minneapolis Community and Technical College. I emailed every single member of the House and Senate in Minnesota and and gave them information about this meeting. At the time of the presentation, there was probably 15 people in this room. At the end of this meeting, an individual came up to me and informed me that earlier that day or that week, he caught somebody ripping down our signs for the presentation because I was posting signs all over the community college and literally all over the metro area and bus stops and whatnot. And I was so disheartened that no one from the politicians of Minnesota showed up. And I said, forget it. I'm going to focus on my schooling and I want nothing to do with this anymore. And so then uh, I focused on my schooling and I moved up to Moorhead, Minnesota, where I was going to get my teacher's degree and uh, finish my Native American studies major. And my goal was to go to the reservation and teach on the reservation. Now in 2000, um, my neighbor downstairs, who was, who was a college student himself, who was very enthralled about learning my story in the Gulf War illness and stuff, he came up to me and gave me a newspaper article that said, don't worry, the military's anthrax vaccinations are safe. And this, this made me livid because they claimed... We know they're safe because they were tested on guinea pigs. And this hit me hard because they more or less claimed that we were the guinea pigs. And so I, all of a sudden, this turned the fire up under my rear end again, and I got active to the point of where I was still in contact with Joyce Riley. And so we organized a town hall meeting in Fargo, right across the river from Moorhead, with Ed Schultz. You recognize that name? Oh, yeah. He's one of the good guys. <laughs> right. Allegedly. <laughs> now, Ed Schultz, I am in Ed Schultz's book, or Straight Talk from the Heartland, because Ed Schultz used to have me on his show discussing Gulf War illness. Well, we had Joyce Riley come, and we did a four-hour simulcast about Gulf War illness and the atrocities that are happening to veterans. At the end of that evening, when they were having audience participation, somehow I found myself saying that I'm going to ride my motorized wheelchair along Highway 10 from Moorhead to the state capitol in St. Paul, 270 miles to bring about awareness to go for illness. And right after I said that, I remember in the back of my head, I said to myself, what did you just say? <laughs> and so I put it out there and lo and behold, it's what I did. However, as I was trying to get the legalities done, because you can't assemble, you can't assemble anymore unless you get a permit. And so I had to go to the Capitol and get permits and whatnot. And on May 5th, 2000, when I was doing a time trial for the last leg of my ride, I was roughly... 10, 15 blocks away from the Capitol when a 80,000 pound garbage truck completely fully loaded was off of its 
regular route by five blocks off of its regular route by two and a half hours with a driver that was driving under probation met me in the crosswalk when I had the green walk and took me out. Now, if anybody knows about commercial trucks, it is against the law for a commercial vehicle to try to run a yellow light or to turn on a red light. However, this driver allegedly claimed that he was trying to beat the yellow light, which was an absolute lie because I already had the walk and and I made eye contact with the driver. So as I looked down at the ground to make sure there wasn't a huge bump from the sidewalk to the street, and then I looked up to roll forward, all of a sudden screaming in my ear is the sound of an engine. And in my wheelchair, I turned to the left where I'm staring at the front grill of a truck, and I believe it said Mac. And the next thing you know, I'm being nailed by a garbage truck. The next thing I see is I'm laying down on the ground on my right side, and I'm staring at the front driver's tire with three rocks embedded in the tread in the form of a pyramid. And it was a black rock, a gray rock, and a white rock. And my eyes focused on that pyramid, realized it was a tire, and then I said to myself, I'm going to be smushed. And then that's all I could remember. And then, uh, then all of a sudden, I open up my eyes, and I'm laying on my right, my left side now, and the last tire on the driver's side is scraping up against my back. I still have the shirt that has the swirl pattern of the tires as it was rubbing up my back. So here I am laying in the intersection and the first individual that comes up to me who is looking over me, I kind of move and look up to him and kind of groan. The first thing he says to me is, oh, my God, you're alive. Another vehicle stops and the guy yells out, did anybody call 911? And somebody else yelled out, I did. And then he said, I'm going to go stop the truck. The truck continued to drive almost six blocks. And when the driver got pulled over, they looked underneath the truck and up wedged in the second axle was my wheelchair, which he dragged for those five to six blocks. Irony is that my wheelchair has a seatbelt in it, which I always refuse to use. Knock on wood, I guess. So I end up in the emergency room for 19 days in ICU and then I end up in a rehabilitation center for another three months, four months. At the end, and this put a kibosh on my original ride. Now my original ride, I sent certified registered mail to Jesse Ventura, Paul Wellstone, Oh, was it Mark, Mark Dayton? And all of them said that they were looking forward to meeting me upon arrival at the Capitol, that they would send a representative or they would meet me there. However, when I got out of the rehabilitation center, the first week of September, on September 9th at 9 o'clock in the morning, I took off on my trek to bring about awareness to Gulf War illness. And when I, re when I arrived at the Capitol, I found out 
three days before I arrived to the Capitol, all three of those politicians were called out of the state of Minnesota. Jesse Ventura allegedly was on a book signing tour. Paul Wellstone and Mark Dayton were in Washington disease. So not only did none of them met me there at the end of my ride, but but uh, they never sent any representation from their offices either. And and I and I think if I was to throw out the theory of why this occurred, that if the world was to know that there were more individuals besides myself that were sick and dying with the same exact illness, it would prove that it was the inoculations and they were giving them prior to the Gulf War. And at this time, nor at that time, can we as a country monetarily compensate the numbers of veterans that are sick. In 2000, when I did my ride, the numbers were 70,000 veterans were sick and dying of Gulf War illness. 40,000 were already dead. Now, we sent 1.3 million American veterans into the Persian Gulf. Now, the numbers are estimated well over 800 to 900,000 veterans are sick and over 100,000 dead. All of the veterans that I knew in the 90s, in the mid-90s to 2000 that I met that were claiming to have go for illness, they're all dead. And, a lot of the... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, and, and, and speaking of um, the numbers, uh, there was going to be a hearing in Washington to compensate the veterans for what the vaccine had done, and there were 400,000 records of military personnel in the Oklahoma City Murrah building. And that was one, the number one reason that they blew that building up and got those records out. As Cody Snodgrass said last on last week's show, uh, it's a simple case of covering up and there isn't enough money in the world to compensate the pain and suffering that you all went through. Hey, you did come face to face with Jesse Ventura in one of your protests did you not oh that's right um well before jesse ventura won his governorship in minnesota i used to be in contact with him and it wasn't a hard or it wasn't a big challenge to get a hold of him he used to be on a radio show on kfan kfan and he used to do an afternoon talk show and in this talk show, he would talk about go for illness and stuff. And so I would find out where he was doing live shows and I would get a ride there or show up there and give him documentation that would prove go for illness. And then he announced that he was going to run for governor. The minute he announced that he was running for governor, his door was no longer open to me. And there was no way that I could get a hold of him and he wouldn't answer or return any phone calls. So after he won the governorship, he did a uh, he did a kind of an acceptance thing at the um, at University of Minnesota where he did kind of a little thank you because it was because a lot of college students came out and voted for him because he swore he would legalize cannabis. However, um, he didn't. But uh, so during this presentation of where he was flaunting his peacock feathers, 
at the end of it, they had a question and answers period. But it was one of those question and answers where you had to fill in your question and submit it. And so he answered these questions and they were like, like softball lobs where it was like, now that you're governor, do you think it's going to be like wrestling? You know, ridiculous questions. And then at the end of these questions, he made this joke. He goes, that's all the questions. I thought there'd be a lot tougher ones. And I worked my way prior to this. I worked my way to the very front of the crowd. And when he said that, I yelled out, I have a question. And he looked down at me. And if if Trump had Superman's laser vision, I would have been disintegrated when he saw it was me. And in my lap, I'm holding this book that has big, bold letters, Gulf War Illness. And right in front of me were all of these newspaper reporters and stuff that all turn towards me and all of a sudden pictures start getting snapped and somebody yells out, ask the question. And then somebody else yells out, ask the question. And so then, uh, so then he had no choice. And so I got to yell out there, you know, Jesse Ventura, now that you are the governor of Minnesota, and an ex-veteran who swore an oath to defend the Constitution and the people that reside within the United States, what are you going to do for the thousand of us veterans that are in the state of Minnesota living and dying with Gulf War illness? And his answer to me was, well, when I was in the military, we had Agent Orange and uh, I don't know much about Gulf War illness. And as soon as he said that, because he was lying, I yelled out to him, well, I brought you a packet to inform you. And then he got, his face got really red. And then somebody yelled, take the packet. And then someone else yelled it. And then pretty soon a bunch of people were chanting it. And so then he had to crouch down and reach down and take this booklet that I made up for him. And I swear the the anger in his eye when he did that is one of my fondest memories in, in my experience. And so he stood there. And you know how some people will like roll up a newspaper? He rolled up this pamphlet this document this this document and he was white knuckling it he was twisting it and squeezing it in his hands and it was it was a delight so i did get to confront him before the uh before the actual ride but uh i do have on youtube the uh audio clip of what I said to Jesse Ventura and what I thought about him. And uh, that can be witnessed by you and your audience if you wish. It's uh, Cannabis Res R-E-Z Solution. Cannabis Res Solution. Uh, they say you are quite an activist. Very, very active in, in your on your YouTube channel. You have some meetings where you are fighting with your own tribe to see the sanity of growing hemp to save your nation as well as we know that hemp could possibly save our world as well. So dip your toe into that activism mode and tell us what you're doing with your cannabis res. Well, um, first of all, if I can clarify that hemp is the Germaic, Arabic word for cannabis. And so when you look at hemp, a hundred years ago, hemp had levels of THC in it. And the THC is the active ingredients that gives you the high 
or the euphoria. And so I like to just call it cannabis and not hemp or marijuana because then you get into this this argument of what is what and which is which where both hemp and marijuana can be used to possibly take us out of the situations that we are in right now. With the cannabis plant, now there is well over 100,000 byproducts that can be made from this plant. If you take a look around you where you're at right now, everything around you except substances that are made from metal or glass can be reproduced from the cultivation of cannabis. And throw on top of that all of the medical um, medications. And I have a challenge with calling cannabis medications because when we start calling it medication, then you get into the technicality of only a doctor can prescribe medicines. However, as a Native American, we are taught that everything is given to us by the computer, by the computer. Oh no, we are in a matrix. (laughs) Everything is given to us by the creator to utilize, to help us live what we call the Bimad de Ziwe we in. Um, Some people refer to it as the red road. So, with all of these potentials that can be cultivated from cannabis, to me it's a no-brainer that if we want to help the reservations, which are literally third world countries and supposedly one of the richest countries in the world, if we really want to help these people, it could easily be attainable by growing cannabis. And and I've I've been trying for years because when I got sick back in the 90s, one of the ways that I would alleviate pain was through the use of cannabis. And I was active in the marijuana fight because I was involved with Normal. And Normal is the net the National Organization for the Reformation of Marijuana Laws. I was so active in normal that when I moved up here to Moorhead, Minnesota, at the college I was going to, we created a normal student organization that we were affiliated with normal. That's how active I was with this. I was so active that when I received my settlement from being ran over by a garbage truck, I immediately put $15,000 to the side to start my original foundation or or nonprofit organization that I tried to get together it was called the Cannabis Resolution. And the hopes and dreams were that the Cannabis Resolution was going to hit the ground so big that I would be able to start a sister group and call it the Cannabis Res, R-E-Z, solution. And that was going to be utilized to help the economical and sustainable businesses on the reservations. And so, in, in and I've been doing, you know, I've literally been doing this, I think the first, uh, The first normal organization that I ever spoke at was probably 1994 in Minneapolis at Loring Park, where we used to have our our 420 rallies. Many a times I've stopped traffic in Minneapolis during a 420 rally as we tried to make people aware of, of cannabis. Now, the the conspiracy behind cannabis is, I believe, 
and this goes into partial theory, but it can easily be proven that the powers that should not be realized at an early period, the potential of the cannabis plant. However, due to the circumstances of big oil, the legalization for the cultivation of cannabis would definitely impede the oil tycoons of making money. In the early 1920s, there was a machine that was called the decortitator that was created that revolutionized the whole harvesting process of cannabis equivalent to the cotton gin and what it did to the cotton industry. And since the cannabis fiber is far superior to cotton, more durable, all of all of the covered wagons were covered with canvas, which came from cannabis. All of the ships, their sails, their ropes were all made out of cannabis because it didn't wear and tear with salt water like other ropes did. And at the same time that this decortitator was made, the oil industry came up with a new synthetic material called polyester. And, and the cannabis plant was a major threat to polyester. And why was polyester created? Because with the oil pumping and the converting it into gas, remember, when you pull oil out of the ground, it's dark, crude, black. When you pump gasoline into your tank, it's clear. So where does all of that blackness go? Through the chimneys and all of the toxic sludge that is created from the process of gasoline. And in America, we started having to look at the Industrial Revolution and the detrimental impact it was having on our country and on the environment. The oil people were being held accountable of doing something with all of that black sludge. And what did they do? They hired a bunch of scientists and said, what can we make out of this sludge? And lo and behold, we get plastics and we get polyester and we get additives and preservatives. And if you really want to look at it, there's a video out there called Toxic Sludge is Good for You, where they've convinced farmers to spray toxic sludge on these fields in the ideology that it helps aerate the soil by causing a little more space in the soil, but also works as a pesticide against weeds and a and a herbicide with or I screwed that up, pesticides with bugs and herbicides with weeds. That if you took your can of wasted oil and if you poured it on the ground somewhere, that would be considered a violation to the Environmental Protection Agency. However, if you were to put it in a spray bottle and diffuse it, that's not a violation of the Environmental Protection Agency. And so these big oil companies found all of these loopholes of how they can continue to poison us with petrochemicals. And if you go look up Dartmouth College, there is a professor from Dartmouth College that wrote that particulates of petroleum in the body will drive you mad. Imagine how much particulates of petroleum we have in our bodies. And all of this petroleum stuff can be replaced with the cannabis plant. 
And when Standing Rock occurred and they were fighting about a pipeline, the ridiculousness of putting a pipeline underneath a natural water resource, when in fact that that pipeline, not only could the pipe itself be made from the cannabis plant, but you can make cannabis concrete where it could be made to hold the structure support and the crossbars could be made out of the cellulose of the cannabis plant and the fuel inside it could be made from the cannabis plant too. And if the cannabis plant methanol or ethanol was to get into the water, it would not have the impact as crude oil or unrefined oil would on the environment. So it's it's literally, in my eyes, in my blind eyes, a no-brainer. And, and if people would do the research, they'd realize this too. And I've made this claim time and time again that if they would legalize cannabis, especially in an industrial means, I would gladly give up smoking cannabis. Nah. However, <laughs> however, I didn't say I wouldn't ingest cannabis. <laughs> I would give up smoking cannabis. Yeah, I, I think they, they, uh, the elites, they became aware of cannabis, hemp, and or marijuana. Henry Ford's car was made of cannabis, stronger than plastic. It ran on cannabis oil. Uh, clothing that our great-grandparents wore is still wearable today. And there was a time when a farmer was required by law to grow cannabis for the war effort. Hemp and, for victory. Exactly. And that, I, I've stated it before that the elites know that we need air, food, and water to survive. And I believe that there are four elements to that equation. And it is air, water, food, and hemp. Another uh, statement you said was that big oil was the reason that they put the kibosh on hemp. Another reason was the Rothschilds, uh, Hearst. Oh, William Randolph Hearst owned the paper and forest industry, and the fact is one acre of hemp is equal to 10 acres of forestry. So therefore, you're hurting Mother Nature by taking out the forest and the trees. Of course, they replant them, but there's nothing like an old-growth forest. But the material, raw materials from one acre of hemp which are which is not the cannabis it's the one that um simpson um i forget well the 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 biggest difference now if we we stay with the word cannabis but then we think of the words marijuana and hemp now if you were to grow cannabis to be as they call marijuana you would plant one seed Every three or four feet, you would want three to four feet around that plant so the plant will grow and it's pruned so it's fat and bushy because you want all of the energy of the plant to utilize growing the bud and growing the seeds. But when you do it as hemp industrially, you plant a seed every two inches because you want the plant to take all its energy to grow nice and tall. Because when it's nice and tall, that's when it has all the fiber and all the cellulose in order to, like the inner bark and everything of it. You know, however, however, back in the day, when you look up George Washington and his writings to his gardener, He wrote his gardener and he said, do not, do not lose a single seed from the Indian hemp field. Now, the Indian hemp was called K. 
cannabis indica. And the Indian hemp was well known for its smoking ability and for what happens from smoking indica. And so when you look way back in the day when George Washington was a kid, if you rolled a cigarette out of hemp or cannabis and you lit it, the end of it got all cherry red, correct? And so they used to call them cigarettes cherries. And where do you think you would get the material to make a cherry cigarette but from your cherry tree? And so when George Washington cut down his father's cherry tree, why? Why would a boy, why would a boy on impulse knowing that you pick cherries off it and once you cut it down, you killed the tree. Why would you do such a thing? However, if you were to cut down your dad's cannabis tree <laughs> it's gonna be because dead. you wanted to dry it, to utilize it and smoke it, I think I would have gotten in trouble for my dad if such a thing happened. And so I cannot tell a lie. <laughs> George Washington was a cannabis user. We all know that. Uh, well, even even Abraham Lincoln, in his memoirs, he said one of his favorite pastimes was to sit out on his porch and smoke the Indian hemp and contemplate life. Paraphrasing, of course. That's why we do it. Well, it's it it is it's like I said, almost like a no brainer and. And it just is mind boggling how we continue to get wrapped up in this whole dichotomy of hemp and marijuana. And we get so wrapped up in trying to label it instead of just doing it. Because my belief is the reason why they are calling it marijuana, why they want to call it marijuana, is because all the patents have already been bought up and paid for under the word hemp. And now that they're calling it marijuana, they can now give it new patent names. And this is this is what's going to be happening. We are going to be having the marijuana hemp wars because you cannot stop pollination. So we're going to have these people that are growing what they think is marijuana outside and then there's people that are going to be growing what they think is hemp outside and they're going to cross pollinate and they're going to ruin each other's pollination. And this is what is happening, that all of the heirloom seeds of cannabis are being destroyed because of this whole dichotomy of hemp and marijuana and I'll share with you where the word marijuana came from. Or, or have, you, have you heard this, Bill? Have you shared this with your audience before? I can't say that I have, but I'm sure I've heard it from you before, so inform my <laughs> audience. Well, um, the word marijuana came from Mexico, the Spanish-speaking people, marijuana. Now, all of a sudden, they got demonized as this wacky tobacco. You know, that all of the jazz musicians were smoking. All the minorities were utilizing this wacky tobacco, this marijuana. And these white women were going to the jazz club and intermingling with the minorities. And, and marijuana was giving the minorities just enough gumption to look white man in the eye. And the white man was like, oh, no, 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 we can't have this. But the Mexicans are a very, very highly Catholic-influenced people. Extremely Catholic is Mexico. One of their most highest deities besides God was Mother Mary and John the Baptist. Mary and John 
John is the masculine for John. The feminine word for John is Juan, Juana. So when they utilized cannabis or hemp, they said it was such a euphoric high that they felt like they were cre- they were communing with the Creator, that they were praying to Mary and John, the Baptist, Mary Juana, and that's where the terminology of marijuana came from. But we've demonized the word, we bastardized the word, we destroyed this incredible plant, cannabis, and and we negate it. Is that a new word? <laughs> By calling it marijuana. Absolutely. Have you heard? I saw a video that they're using herbicides on marijuana cannabis plants. Uh, the herbicide is great for grapes because you never heat a grape. And they did a study of all. Uh, they did a study of most of the dispensaries of marijuana, and they tested it. And these herbicides are actually destroying, not necessarily destroying the benefits of the herb, but it's creating a poison in it which outweighs the benefits of it. And they're testing some of the best known and most largest distributing resources, um, distribution centers, and the stuff is really, really bad for you. Have you heard anything about that? Yes, yes. And and this is my conspiracy theory that I believe that a large percentage of the cannabis or the medical marijuana that's being distributed is being grown in government facilities and they are tweaking it and genetically manipulating it because they're trying to find another way to keep us complacent, to keep us docile, to keep the masses on their gluteus maximuses. <laughs> well, if they legalized it and everybody was smoking it, wouldn't we all be just so laid back? <laughs> Well, yeah, absolutely. If it's if it's uh, indica or if it's sativa, depending on how your own bio rhythms are, because this is the other thing that people don't realize: we have indica and we have sativa. One of them grows incredibly in the southern hemisphere; the other one grows incredibly in the northern hemisphere. Where within us we have the duality of nature for lack of a better term, the feminine and the masculine, which I, I, I hate that because people regard it as, you know, one is a good thing, one is a bad thing, because I'm not, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a chauvinistic pig, and I sure the hell am not a feminist, nor would I ever want to be, because in the name itself, feminist, is sexist because it has the word female in there. So I guess I would call myself an equalist because I want equal rights for everybody. But when you utilize cannabis in this means of, okay, I need more energy, I'm going to use this cannabis. I need less energy and I need to fall asleep. I need to use this cannabis because each individual is different. But when you generalize it, you know, they say that sativa is going to make you super hyper, make you more active, and indica is going to knock you on your butt, you know. But it depends on the individual. You know, you have to be your own judgment, you know. And, and I've made the comment before that if you can't get off your ass, you need to get off the grass, because some people can be psychologically addicted to it and utilize it as a crutch, you know. But would I rather have somebody using cannabis as a means to work with their depression or their bipolarism than these incredible, horrible pills that are being utilized now? <laughs> Absolutely. Give me the cannabis. Or becoming- And in my own... I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, or becoming a bar fly. 
uh, alcohol and daily drinking of simple beer. Uh, I've seen examples of it all around myself. What simple addiction to beer will do to the body, the brain, and the individual. Well, this is the challenge with the Native Americans and the reservation. You know, there there is always already an abundance of alcoholism within the Native American community. Um, one month, like I want to say, like within six months ago, on my reservation alone, we had eight overdoses, and I believe three of them were fatalities from pharmaceutical medications and stuff. Now, the challenge on our reservation, because of the reservation is underneath the federal guidelines that were still considered wards of the federal government when supposedly we're a sovereign nation, all of the majority of the jobs on the reservations are provided by the tribal council. Now, they run under the stipulations of the federal government. The federal government says if you got any THC in your system, you're immediately fired. Okay, so then because of this, all of the Native Americans on the weekend, what do they turn to? Alcohol or pharmaceutical drugs? Because pharmaceutical drugs only stay in your system for a short period of time where cannabis can stay into your system up to three weeks. Uh, believe me, I know for a fact it can stay, depending on the quality and the amount you smoke, and I lived it to where I was tested, and almost six weeks later, I was still turning up positive. So this 30, this uh, three weeks, or even a month is a lie. So if you quit after a month and go for a urine test for a job, don't be surprised if you may come up positive. Well, and this is the other thing that is so ridiculous because for over 20 years of dealing with the Veterans Administration, the VA hospital, I've consistently asked for cannabis to use for my pain management, and I've continually been denied. In 2014, the... VA finally prescribed me Marinol, which is a synthetic cannabis. It's like Dronabinol, but it's the generic Dronabinol. Within a year period, I was almost completely off my Oxycontins. Completely off. I went in there and I told them, if I could get some more of the dronabinol, I believe that in the next three months, I can be absolutely 100% off of my off of my Oxycontins. And the VA said, no, you can't have them. And, and when I asked why, they told me that I couldn't have it because I tested positive for THC in my urine. And it's like, you guys gave me the THC. It's in the Dronabinol. Well, what quality rope are they smoking? Exactly. And, and so now I have to beg and plead. And right now, the VA has completely cut off all of my pain medication. We're at one time they had me prescribed 140 milligrams of Oxycontins a day. Well, that's the, uh, <clears throat> that's the plan. We get you hooked on pharmaceuticals, and then we cut you off, and then you have to buy our illicit heroin, uh, and, you know, which is all government supplied. So they get you coming and going, and we all know it's eugenics. They just want us all dead. Now with this big, huge Oxycontin scare, they're cutting the veterans off of their pain meds now. And they're not giving us any kind of sufficient uh, uh, alleviant to take its place. And in the state of Minnesota, the cannabis 
law, the medical marijuana law that they passed is absolutely asinine. And I'm sorry, I've said the word as four times now, <laughs> including that last one. Hey, try, but, a, try assassin. That's got two asses in it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so now this new law in Minnesota, and when you watch Minnesota, when Minnesota passes the law, it kind of sets the standard for the rest of the country. And the law that was passed is not beneficial to the people. If they really wanted to be beneficial for the people, I call it the simple seven solution, where every adult, depending on what age they categorize as an adult, I say 18, because if the federal government can have an 18-year-old go around the world and kill other people in their name, then at 18, they should be able to make the decision of utilizing cannabis or not. However, whatever the name is, whether they want to say 21 or whatever. So when that, that number is established, so in every household, one adult can grow seven plants. The second adult can grow five more. The third adult, three more. The fourth adult, one more. Because there is no reason that you need more than seven plants for one individual. However, if you are under strict medical duress or health duress, I can see where the best way of utilizing cannabis is to juice it, to let it grow to be about a foot and a half, and then just take the whole thing right from the stock and throw it in the juicer, which is the absolute miracle way of using cannabis. But in that situation, yes, I can see more than seven plants. But to smoke cannabis socially and for the majority of all medical reasons, you don't need more than seven plants. And then if you want, say you have a green thumb and you like, I want to grow for everybody. Then you just go and get a permit and you grow your plant. And when you harvest your plant, you bring it to a properly ran dispensary. They test it for the carcinogens in it. And if you pass the standards, they'll buy it at fair market rate and sell it because there's going to be some people that can't grow plants. There would be some people that don't want to grow plants. They would rather just go and buy it. And the market on its own merit will dictate whether or not you stay in business or not. Because if you don't grow good quality cannabis, then people aren't going to buy it. And this is what has happened in these states now that have done cannabis for so long, the federal government stepped back and watched, and the bankers stepped back and watched how it was all going to work. And then now the corporations are coming in and you're seeing all of these corporate cannabis farms popping up all over the place. I don't think there's any way that you can get to that position on good merits. And so, you know, I'm the naysayer. All right, brother. Yeah, anytime you need me, Bill, if you need someone to jump in, you know I can babble on and babble on pretty well. Love you, man. Hey, you Uh have a great evening. So let me say thank you once again. And you're supposed to say. (laughs) No, thank you. (laughs) All right, toodles. Bye-bye, brother.